today in the topic of lecture, as you can see, the zero and decimal place value system in India. So let me share with you this uh, slide where I'm showing you, I'm quite sure that you are all aware of this number zero in your mathematics curriculum. And have you ever given it a thought that this number is a kind of weird number? It doesn't go by the rules made for others. Everywhere in mathematics, if you just try to understand, you will see that it makes its own rule, not just the number zero, but every zero like concepts in mathematics, be it a null set, be it a null matrix, be it a null vector, everywhere its rule is different. I prefer to call it the naughty boy of mathematics family, but we can't do without it. And my friends, this number had to be invented at a point of time in human history. Not like other numbers which are called natural numbers, this number is a work of human intellect. And as you have listened to Professor Manjul Bhargav in the morning, that it's widely believed that this was in India, that this number bloomed into its true potential as the true predecessor of the modern mathematical zero. So today in coming 20, 25 minutes that I have, I'd like to see, I'd like to push it back further in history with evidence as far as possible to see the origin of this number zero in Indian soil. Have you ever been to this place? This is Gwalia Fort, my friends. If you ever be there, search for this Chatur Bhuja temple, the temple of Lord Vishnu in that Gwalia Fort. And if you enter the fort, this temple, in one of the walls, you will find this stone inscription. This stone inscription, if you blow up one particular part of it, there you see in Nagari numeral, the number 270 written. What is this uh, stone inscription all about? It's a land grant by the then King Mir Bhoja to this uh, Lord Vishnu temple. And uh, the part, th this is actually the Sanskrit transcription of that entire writing there. And there I have marked by red this particular part of our interest, the number 270 in Nagari. If you look at the English translation, the transliteration of that, it says that this is 270 royal hastas. That's a you know, measure of the length of the piece of the land. And historically, it is uh, generally accepted as the oldest known stone inscription of the modern zero in human civilization. But if you have noted the time, it's only 9th century. Does it mean that India started using zero in 9th century only? Of course not. So let us see how far can we push it back. If instead of stone inscription, you are ready to accept the copper plates, the charter, land grant charter, the oldest one that we know is from 594 CE, the Sankheda charter in Gujarat. But that's on copper. And somehow some experts are not very you know, pleased with the authenticity of that, though they do not put very strong reason for you know, questioning the authenticity but they do have their own reservations. And that's not all. Even if you go by the stone inscriptions, there are other candidates much earlier than this uh, Gwalior inscription. And uh, there is a list. Uh, the time will not permit me to get into one by one systematically. This is in one of the uh, fantastic articles by Professor Michel Danino Badwasri, where you can find the reference to all these prior to this Gwalior inscription, some stone inscription in uh, place value system where zero is present. Now, if I ask you who invented zero, I know most of you will say Aryabhata, but that's a very unfortunate misinformation. So before I get into further serious topic, let me share with you this uh, popular uh, joke that is there in social media. You see there Aryabhata, of course, it's an imagination of the sculptor. The joke says one day Aryabhata asked his wife, will you allow me to spend the night out with my friends? And the wife says, accordingly to your calculation, you see, you are a calculator, you are such a great mathematician, so why don't you calculate yourself? What's the probability of my giving consent to this? And it is then Aryabhata invented zero. Yeah. So everybody laughs at it. But you see, what uh, we find is very unfortunate that this is complete a piece of misinformation, wrong information. Aryabhata's time, as you can see there, written below the bars there, it's in uh, fifth and sixth century. But we can date back with evidence, Indian zero to at least 
seven, eight hundred years, if not more, right? The ancient India, the part, the most unfortunate part of it is if you go back prior to Ashokan period, is all Sruti. There is no written evidence. So always is a question of you know interpretation and academic controversy among the you know person at the know. So let us see today that I am trying to how far we can push it back with evidence, right? So when you talk about this ancient India, one must very care carefully, clearly understand that this is not the present geographical Indian location. It's the entire subcontinent that we refer to. Indian mathematics refers to this entire landmass, right? With reference to that, immediately I can take you 200 years back to this Khmer inscription of zero, which is in Cambodia. And it is 200 years older than the inscription of Gwalior. You can see the timeline there. It's uh, rediscovered by this gentleman, Professor Amir Axel, in only 2013. It was uh, there and it was lost in the uh, Pol Pot regime of Khmer Rouge. And then after a lifetime search, there's a fantastic book, Finding Zero, by Professor Amir Axel. If you're interested, you can check it. Then there you find this uh, in the Khmer writing, the Shaka era reached the year 605 on the fifth day of the warning moon. And this 605, as you can see there in the screen, that O in the middle, that zero, that's called bold dot zero. You see, it looks different than the modern zero. And my friends, this is how zero used to look like initially in India, bold dot. Not just the way you write it now. It was you know, completely blackened, the whole thing, right? So how far can we push it back? From other references, as I told you, there's not necessarily mathematical references all the time. This is a page from a drama called Vasavdatta by Shuvandhu. It's a romantic drama where you find this particular line, allegory, Shunna Vindava Eva Vilikhitam. It talks about, it's, it's a kind of metaphor. The writer tells that as if God himself, by the chalk of moon, has drawn the stars in the sky like zero dots. So you see, even in a drama, in that period of time, it's between some, somewhere between 4th and 5th century, in a drama, it's not a mathematics text, the allegory refers Shunya as a Vindu, the dot mark. And this dot mark zero, as you can see the translation there by Louis Gray, it refers to the point of the form of null sign in Bakshali manuscript. In the morning in the talk of Professor Manjul Bhargav, he just mentioned Bakshali manuscript. So this is Bakshali manuscript, found in 1880 uh, at a place some uh, 80 kilometers of northwest of Peshawar. This Bakshali manuscript, 70, you know, mutilated folio of birch bark. It's an amazing piece of mathematics there, amazing. You won't believe the level of mathematics you find there, including the, you know, Manjul made a fantastic list but I, with due respect, can add one from Bakshali, approximation square root. Akrite slishta krityunam shesha cheda dishanguna tadbarga dalashang slishtang iti shuddhi kritikhaya. And you will be amazed to know that this refers to a formula which you can cook up from this. If you break it up this Sanskrit, the formula turns out to be exactly the same as now known as Newton Raption method for finding approximate roots, which was done by Newton using calculus and this is the time of Bakshali of course much prior to Newton but exact time frame again is hotly debated as you can see there is some carbon dating of this manuscript written in Gotha dialect of Sharda script different pages were subjected to radiocarbon dating it is now kept in Bodleian library like many of Indian you know things that has been you know smuggled out or taken force forcibly during the British period it's in Oxford Bodleian Library. And I think time has come to raise our voice to bring such things back to India, not just Kahinur that we bother about. This is much more valuable piece of human intellect than Kahinur. So this is kept in Bodleian Library and Bodleian people themselves have put it under the radiocarbon test. And one of the page, as you can see, is in third century, almost contemporary to that Suvandhu document of Vasavdatta. And why this is so important, apart from many other fantastic mathematics, arithmetic mainly, it's replete with these bold dot zero symbols. As you can see, this is one of the 
page I have taken with view acknowledgement to Bill Castleman, you see there this particular page, all those numbers have been recalculated. There's a large numbers, large numbers and numbers written in fractions, numerator by denominator. And all these calculations, not just the formula, every formula was actually supplemented by four, five, six mathematical problems. It's a kind of problem book, with problems with solution, this Bakshali manuscript. And there you find abundant this bold dot zero. And that is why exact time frame of Bakshali manuscript is very important in the history of zero. That when India started writing, this perhaps is the oldest known document regarding the bold dot written zero. But does it mean that India started writing it in only third century? They knew it much earlier. Manjul somehow didn't mention that in the morning talk, but I can take you back further. It's in third century BC. This is one of the page of the document. Uh, this is Shutra 29 and uh, Shutra 30. Rupe Shunyam and B Shunne. You will come to know in much more details, I'm sure, in the talk of Professor Srinivas, next of Pingala Chanda Sutra. In the eighth chapter of Pingala Chanda Sutra, there are categorical mention of these two, Rupe Shunyam and D Shunne, into a combinatorial calculation where this Shunya cannot be anything else than the mathematical zero referred to. And this is another point that has been mentioned in the morning by Manjul. The idea of zero in Panini. He told about the structuralist Panini's grammatical structure, the deep structure level of mathematics. There is a rule called Adarshanam Lopaha. This Lopaha, vanishing, the idea was the vanishing of middle morpheme of a number. And he said that it's a kind of grammatical ancestor of our modern zero, the placeholder zero. You know, zero plays two roles in mathematics. One is placeholder, like that which makes difference between 101 and 1001 and 11, when you write them not when you speak. You see, when you speak, you don't require zero. If you say 100, it doesn't require zero. It is required only when you write. So be it very clear that when India started writing, this necessity emerged, not before that. Not before that, it was a fantastic decimal system. And one can see that such a system cannot thrive without the concept of zero. But there is no written evidence because it was all, all the way oral tradition, right? So this Adarshanam Lopa, there is a fantastic book, Zero in Panini by M.D. Pandit. If you want to go through it, fairly technical, that will show you the Paninian instrument of grammatical analysis, how it plays a very significant role in the mathematical development. And perhaps mathematicians of that time was, you know, they got their inspiration from this Paninian idea of Lopa to accept zero as a number in its own right. You see, if I go further back, the Farthest one that we can trace is perhaps in uh, Gopatha Brahmana. You know, Brahmana is one of the earlier layers of uh, Sanskrit uh, Vedic literature after the Sanghitas, Brahmana, then Aranyaka and Upanishada. So Gopatha Brahmana, you find this Chitram, Kham, Iti Uktam. Kho happens to be the most common parlance of zero used in ancient India. See, Kho means the sky, the vast, limitless, limitless expanse. That was... This is something called Bhuta Shankha. Many other references, equivalent references were made to understand and communicate the idea of zero. Gagana, Ambara, and on and on and on. This is a whole complete dictionary of Bhuta Shankha, not just for zero, for every other numbers, right? So that's the oldest one. And then uh, at the last one that I, you can see here, mentioned by uh, Manjul in the morning talk again, this is uh, Brahma Spurashi Dhanto by Brahma Gupta, who talks about Dhanar Dhanam, Rinam Rinayor, Dhana Rinayor, Antaram, and Shamaikya Kam, the Dhana and the Rina, as he has pointed out, the positive and the negative. And Brahma Gupta first formally utters this principle, keeps it in writing, but that doesn't mean that it was invented right at that point. He just put it down as far as we know. There are many things that are lost in ancient Indian tradition. Thousands of manuscripts are laying here and there over the world which are yet to be deciphered. There you see this Samaikya Kham, it tells the positive and negative number if they are of equal value and they are added, it becomes zero. That's not a placeholder zero, that's a number in its own right. Just like two minus two equal to zero, it's a number in the same footing as others. And just prior to that, I have mentioned Aryabhata. 
He didn't invent zero. He used it in his complicated calculations in Katupayadi system. He is enunciating the decimal place value system in his Aryabhatiya. Ekam, dasacha, satancha, etc., etc., going up to kuttar budancha brindam, 10 to the power 9. And he is explicitly telling you that sthanat sthanam dasagunam swat. From one place to other, this is the place value notation. From one place to other, dasagunam. You have to multiply a place by 10. That's what you do now. The decimal system of place value system of numbers. You see, if you look at this number zero, you may think that how this English word came into being. Just like the word sign was explained today morning by Manjul. It comes from shunya, suna yat, right? And then as a semantic extension, it's actually grammatically, it comes from the verb she, which means, you know, uh, this uh, word is shunam which means lack, which means, uh, you know, something uh, uh, hollow and so on. And from semantic extension, it uh, leads to this idea of nothingness. And as I told you already, and you can see in your screen, that there were several equivalent words. And be uh, very careful to note the last two. Shunya was also represented as Purnya and Ananta. That's the philosophy, that's the backbone of our whole, whole uh, uh, I mean, civilization. And this comes into being when you comes to the story of zero. Shunya was also referred to as Purna, as a kind of dichotomy between nothing and everything. The God himself was seen in Indian culture like that. Minuter than the minutest and larger than the largest simultaneously. That was the idea of this number Shunya. And you see, this number later went to Arab in the court of Caliph al Mamun in 9th century, and it was got it got translated by Al Khwarizmi as Sifra, which literally means nothing. So that dual meaning of nothing and everything was lost. That philosophy was lost. It was it, it became just a representative of nothing, Sifra. And that was latter by this Fibonacci, whom you had again a mention in the morning talk. In uh, 1202, when he was writing a book, Liber Abaci, the book of numbers. Fibonacci translated it as Zephyrum in Latin, which means very insignificant, light, westerly breeze, almost insignificant. You see that nothingness was at the back of his mind. And this word Zephyrum later gradually changed in Europe, in various civilizations, in Venetian dialect. It changed to Zephyro, and then at a point of time, zero in French, zero in Spanish, and zero, the modern word in mathematics. That's the journey. The whole journey, if I get into details, will take more than one hour if I have to explain that. So I'm not going to do that. And this is just one piece of interesting information. The first written appearance of the word zero in Europe is only in, as you can see there, 1491, in a Florence book by Filippi Calendri. The book is De Arithmetica Opusculum, 1491, my friends. And you see, if you want to listen to it if you want to know details of this idea of the number zero it's not just with the perspective of india you have to justify another point that there are so many other great ancient civilizations what about them what about their enumeration system why didn't they get hold of zero and if they got hold it why do i bother about indian zero only in what sense indian zero is considered as the true progenitor of our modern zero so to know up in details it takes hours so what i can do i humbly invite all of you to my gallery. This is Zero Gallery instituted in Kolkata in my institute, Ramakrishna Mission Residential College last year. Anytime you come to Calcutta, you are most welcome to visit this Zero Gallery, where I have tried to put side by side in this permanent panel exhibition, the whole history of Zero across 5,000 years of human civilization. And that also led to one particular thing, the of Zero. Another example which was shown last uh, December in the uh, this is a 40 minute documentary. I just showed you one script of just a snippet of that. Zero. Zero. No single, no single mathematical creation has, has ever, ever been more potent for the general, general outgo of intelligence and power. In this, In this engaging tour of pictorial history, tour of pictorial history the journey takes us through the Egyptian, the journey takes us through the Egyptian hieroglyphs, Inca, Kibu, Inca Kibu, Babylonian clay tablets, Babylonian clay tablets, 
Mayan glides, followed by the great Greek civilization, followed by the great Greek civilization, the mighty Roman Empire in the West, the mighty Roman Empire in the West. Whereas we also come across, whereas we also come the across, Chinese rod numerals, the Chinese rod numerals, the lofty philosophy, the lofty embracing philosophy, the concept of nothing, embracing the, the concept Indian of nothingness by the ancient Indian seers, which gradually paved the path, which gradually paved the path of zero for emancipation of zero in its own right, as a number in its own right. I think. Uh, uh, we uh, lack of time, we can't get into details of that. But this is available in YouTube. It's a 40 minute documentary. And if you want to listen to a uh, more formal lecture on it, this is a lecture that I can refer to you a one hour lecture given at IIT Gandhinagar a few years back. Uh, the reference is there. You just write my name in YouTube, we'll come to my name with mathematics, right? And this is uh, the culture. This is the culture, Indian culture, that actually gave rise to this peerless concepts of zero and decimal place value system. If you appreciate the role of zero in mathematics, you must have a place value system. Otherwise, the, under, the, the importance of zero cannot be realized. And both these two are the original contribution of India. I see, I just ask you to read, uh, say, the second one of them, the most of the great discoveries and inventions of which Europe is so proud would have been impossible without a developed system of mathematics. And that in turn would have been impossible if Europe had been shackled by the unwieldy system of Roman numerals. This unknown man who devised the new system, the system is the decimal system. From the world's point of view after the Buddha, the most important son of India, his achievement, though easily taken for granted, was the work of an analytic mind of first order. Yes, nowadays it's easily taken for granted. We all learn numbers this way. But first one who devised this was, as you can see, this is said by one of the great historian, A.L. Basham, in his book, The Wonder That Was India. And there is Bourbaki, a group of eminent European mathematicians writing in the book that our actual decimal system, which by the agency of the Arabs is derived from Hindu mathematics, where its use is attested already from the first century of our era. It must be noted, moreover, that the conception of zero as a number and not just a simple symbol of separation. That's the placeholder, 101 and 1001. The role as a placeholder, but it's a pure number, not just a simple placeholder. That conception and its introduction into calculation also count amongst the original contribution of the Indians or the Hindus. And you see, when it comes to Roman, when it comes to Roman multiplication, this is like this. It's a very clumsy way of doing things. It's just multiplying 58 by 25, which class two students can do easily. But you look at the right hand side. That is to be done if you understand, want to understand by Roman system that you are multiplying this to number. So you see shackles, unwieldy Roman numerals. That's one example of that. You see, if you look at this uh, idea of place value system, again, my question is how far can we push it back? The farthest that I could find is this reference in one Vadanta Bashumitra in his uh, book, uh, on Madhamak school of uh, Buddhism, he refers to this idea and uh, says, explains dharma, the state from one state to other, how it changes. Salakshana dharana the dharmaha. He is referring to a fantastic, uh, which is uh, statement is translated here. When in the unit's position has the value of unit, the marker when put in the unit's position has the value of unit. In the hundreds position, that of a hundred. In the thousands position, that of a thousand. So this is clear understanding of place value system. And this is in first century CE. If you look at the Vedic corpus, in Rig Veda, you have more than 3,000 numbers, oral number names in Sanskrit. Look at those number names. They are so beautifully designed grammatically. Look at the number like Sapta Satani Vinsati, 720. Shahasrani Shata Dasa. 1,110. Just, you know, suppress these placeholder names. You see, the number in written form pops up. That's the beauty of this Sanskrit number vocabulary. There is, and that's what Datta points out in one of his good articles, that one can conclude that structure of Sanskrit numeral system contains the key to the decimal place value system. You see, this has a polynomial aspect also. Certainly, you know about polynomials. And for, for example, if I take that as an example here, this uh, number here, uh, the polynomial here, 2x cubed plus 2x plus 2. You see, the polynomial can also be represented by an ordered tuple of coefficients. That's what the ring theory that Manjula was talking about in the morning. There, the polynomials are represented by these tuples. 
So fantastic thing is when you want to represent the polynomial as a standard notation, the first one, you just drop one particular term if it is not there. Just like here, the term with x square is absent. You don't write 0 x square. You simply write 2x cubed plus 2x plus 2. But when you want to represent it in the corresponding representation as an ordered tuple of coefficients, there you require 0. Just like if I just again go back to the Sahasrani Shatadasa, if you look at this, uh, you know, color coordination, 1000, 100, 110, and no unit. That's the oral part. And when you come to the written part, it just pops up like 1x cubed, 1x square, 1x, and nothing else but the corresponding numeral, if you want to get out of it, the coefficients, it cannot be just 1, 1, 1. That will lead to a different polynomial. It will be 1, 1, 1, 0. So that's how there is a relationship between this oral Vedic Sanskrit number names and the written decimal place value notation. And this actually paved path for further generalization of polynomial algebra and other base systems like binary. And this, this was actually recognized by Newton himself. I've given a reference there in that particular book. Newton pointed out that I'm surprised why this didn't occur to anyone else, that these newly introduced doctrine of number can be automatically, you know, it, it, it can work for polynomials in algebraic version as well. You know, why did it happen in India? It happened because of this philosophical backbone. These rules are philosophical statements, Purnamada, Purnamida, etc. It says Purnasha, Purnamadaya, Purnameva, Vashishyati. Now, if you say it's philosophy, it's philosophy. Of course, it's not a mathematical rule. But you see, it is paving the path for this mathematical rule to be appreciated. When infinite system, you take infinite number of things out of it. There's an infinite set, you take out a subset of infinite element. What remains is still infinite. The Purna, as I told you, is also Shunya. And you see, 0 minus 0 also gives you 0. So philosophically, Indian society was ready to reach at that. You know, as I told you, in this Kathopanishad, Anoronian Mahato Mahyan, minuter than the minutest and larger than the largest, simultaneity, the idea of Maya or void in the Vedanta philosophy, the Abhava in the Noyaic philosophy, Nishkala Shiva, partless emancipation of God Shiva, and even in Mahayan Buddhism doctrine of devoidness, Shunnata, the idea of Nirvana is complete shunnata, to imbibe the concept of complete shunnata, chatushkati binir mukta, which is considered as the pragna paramita, the highest form of knowledge. The society was ready to receive this concept of zero as a number, philosophically. So when mathematicians living in the society proposed that we need to have a numerical symbol representing nothingness, I have a pen, I take it away. How many pens do I have? You say no pen, but that's not the direct answer. Direct answer requires a numeral. I have zero pens. We don't talk in this language. So till we talked only oral, we didn't require zero. The point of time when we started writing, zero was necessary. And here, since I'm running out of time, I'm finishing with this. Will our search ever find anything new? Where have the rest of evidence has gone? It is now. Will our search of ever zero find anything new? new? These questions of you zero. have inherited it's now, continues with and the history of zero exact time continues with you. Person. When these fantastic things actually originated in India, and here I leave you with this reference book, where you can find what I have been talking about till now. This is a supplementary to the zero gallery, and this is, uh, of course, incomplete list of reference. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Just providing the uh, card list. I can't can't hear you. Uh, can somebody give me a microphone? Yes. Right. Uh -huh, zero?
See, my point in relating Purna and Shunna is what we have historically written over there, that I can give you concrete reference where the word Purna is used in Vashkara, you know, Vashkara Charya. Rashaguna Purna Mahishama Shaka Nripa Shamae Bhavat Mamat Patti. And if you just decipher this, you will get this number, this time of birth when you take this Purna as a zero. Right. So metaphorically, what you are talking about, perhaps these are other way of looking at it interpretation. My point was very simple that the nomenclature Purna, along with many others, these are called Bhuta Shankha, and they were used simultaneously to maintain the prosodical need. You know, those time it was always uh, mostly in, you know, poetic metrics. So due to the need of prosody, every number had very many, many names. So equivalent to this was Purna and Ananta as well. The idea, as we perceived it, comes from the philosophy of Indian uh, schools, where this Purna, the god himself, is also considered as Shunna. As I have given a reference of Maitreya Upanishad, where god is being invoked as Esa Shuddha Shunya Shantaha. So my point is this, that this idea was already there in the society. This is unlike what happened in West. If you look at the Greek society and Greek culture, they also reached this kind of idea of zero and nothingness, but they didn't accept it. They challenged it. They said, how can nothing be represented by something? And with all these kind of conundrums, they stopped it there. They knew it, but they suppressed it. Indian society didn't do it due to this philosophical backbone of India.